Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our program titled Fact or Fiction, Busting Common Nutrition Myths. I am Jenny Starr. I'm the Health and Wellness Specialist for the Kansas City Public Library. Our presenter today is Diana Dillon, who is a registered dietitian with the Tasty Balance here in Kansas City. I'm really excited to have her today. A couple of just Zoom housekeeping items. If you are not speaking, please remain muted in order to minimize background noise. Uh, you can ask questions today either by unmuting or adding them to the chat. I will monitor the chat um, and make sure that your questions are presented at the right time. And I'm just gonna go ahead and turn the time over to Diana. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Jenny. All right. Well, I'm excited to be here. So I thank the Kansas City Library and Jenny for inviting me. Um, a little bit about me, for those of you. Um, I am a registered dietitian with the Tasty Balance. We are a local dietitian private practice here in Kansas City. We also have some dietitians that are actually in St. Louis, but we have a physical space here in Brookside area of Kansas City, and then I work mostly virtual right now. Um, I also work in health technology as a consultant, um, and I have kids, so I, I not that it's another job of mine, it's probably my favorite occupation is being mom to two little kids, um, but more importantly, I'm an advocate for health. Um, that's why I'm here today to discuss these nutrition myths and talk about um, nutrition and nutrition science. Um, I do like to specify that the Tasty Balance, we are a weight inclusive dietitian practice, meaning that we create a safe space for everybody um, of all body uh, shapes and sizes. We promote our nutrition work through a health at every size framework using intuitive eating as a lens as well. Um, and so I like to just highlight my privileges as a dietitian in the nutrition space. So I've listed those here. Um, I am not perfect as a human being, and I am constantly learning, growing, and, and evolving my nutrition practice and myself as a person in the field. So I like to just really highlight the privileges that I do hold in that space. Um, my contact details on our website is below as well. So let's get started. So in our time today, we will be covering a few different things. So first, I am gonna go through a little bit of an understanding of what diet culture is and how it impacts some of these common nutrition beliefs or myths that society has. Then we're gonna jump into these five common nutrition myths and kind of break down some of the science and research um, to debunk them. And then I'm gonna briefly kind of go through some tools for critical thinking on how to really evaluate nutrition science, if it's credible or not, because the information is a vast place. There's a lot out there and not all of it is true. And then at the end, I will also open it up for question and answer. So please during the presentation, if you have any um, questions, try to put them in the chat feature um, because then I will try to address them as we go. If for some reason I forget, we have that time at the end. But let's get started. Okay. So first things first, what is diet culture? So there, this is kind of a, I would say a newer term for maybe some people. Um, I think about this every day being in the nutrition field and there's lots of different definitions of what diet culture is. So really it is a system of societal beliefs that uphold thinness or a specific pursuit of health and weight loss that really upholds like a moral virtue um, and value to health and thinness. So a lot of the myths that we'll talk about today are really gonna kind of be steeped in this diet culture philosophy or theory, you know, system of beliefs. So we're gonna kind of break those down and debunk them with the science. Um, so the problems of this sort of system and way of thinking in diet culture is that it really can compromise our individual um, health in many different ways because we start to maybe second guess ourselves. We stop listening to ourselves and going by what media headlines and what, you know, the vast majority of society thinks is true in order to be healthy. Um, it can really degrade your personal body image, self-esteem, um, and just innate trust and awareness of your physical cues. Um, and that can be very problematic for health in many ways. It also perpetuates misinformation and just some faulty science that we'll take a look at today. Um, and as well as this diet culture, um, these beliefs, they tend to uh, 
continue to oppress people who don't align with its version of health. People in different um, body shapes, sizes, from different backgrounds, different, um, all sorts of differences. Um, so really, um, that is what diet culture is and the problems with it. I could do a whole class on this uh, in and of its own, but I will not. Um, so let's quickly take a look to really just understand a little bit more about what diet culture is. This is how it might show up for us as individuals. So this is maybe thinking, okay, there are good foods and bad foods, really kind of upholding a moral value to food choices or within ourselves if we eat them. Um, maybe having a fear of gaining weight or a fear of living in a larger body size. This is also known as fat phobia. You know, this is something that our society, unfortunately, with diet culture beliefs tends to uphold, you know, the thin body as the picture of health or how we should be. Um, praising or complimenting weight loss, right? So thinking through conversations with people and how normalized, talking about weight, talking about diets that we're on and how we're restricting certain food groups, that's very normal normalized and that is a symptom or a piece of diet culture um, but it can be very negative and very damaging to have these conversations um, or just normalize all of this talk around trying to change um, body shape size things like that um, feeling guilt shame or just you know maybe some adverse feelings when we eat certain foods this can be super normal there's nothing wrong if you do feel these things um, but it could be a sign that maybe there needs to be some work on your relationship with food and and your body um, other things like fasting detoxing you know suppressing your appetite or doing different types of cleansing diets with lots of supplements and things like that um, those kind of fads or kind of trendy things. Also like wellness culture type of um, things to do or things that are all over, you know, social media. Um, it really can, again, degrade our ability to listen to our own physical cues for hunger and fullness and other things as well. Um, it might show up as avoiding certain foods or having cheat days. Um, again, that's like that negative connotation of having a cheat day um, or using movement. You know, it's not just food and nutrition, but maybe it's also using movement um, or exercise as a means of punishment versus a way of nourishing your body. This is not a comprehensive list. Um, there are so many other ways um, that diet culture can show up on an individual level in everyday life. So we're now going to move into the myths. And I think that this is a really important distinction to show that diet culture is going to show up in some ways, you know, in some bigger beliefs that our society holds. So that's why I wanted to really illustrate what diet culture is. So let's jump into some of those myths. And what I do want to start by saying here is that if you have ever believed any of these things to be true, I, this is not meant to shame you or make you feel bad by any means. What I aim to do here is really just provide factual information and kind of decipher some of these common you know, beliefs or myths around nutrition, that how diet culture and society has really influenced some of these ways of thinking around nutrition. So let's jump in with the first one. Okay. So our first myth is eating past 7 p.m. will make you gain weight or store fat. This is a very common one. Absolutely. Um, and let's kind of just debunk it right now. So this is pretty much based on the idea that our metabolism slows down when we fall asleep and that the undigested calories that are, you know, sitting in our stomach, the food that we are not digesting or the idea that it's just sitting there in our stomach is going to be stored as fat. So I'm just going to say this is based on faulty weight science. So this is definitely false. This is not true. Um, this was generally came about because there was numerous, like three or four studies that were done on animals, mice to be specific. And in these studies, they basically theorized that um, the body might use calories in the evening differently um, at a different time of the day. So it basically was shown in the mice. And we can't really take my studies and, you know, generalize those to human studies. Um, but they theorized that mice who ate in opposition of their circadian rhythm gained significantly more weight um, than those who ate only during their waking hours. So, you know, we can't really take mice and extrapolate that to humans. 
However, what I do like to, to note here is that absolutely we can gain weight past eating, you know, later in the evening, but it's not due to the time of day. It is more so due to possibly what we're eating, how much we're eating, things like that. So the time of day has no physiological um, impact on weight gain or how our body is going to metabolize food. We're going to digest and utilize food no matter what time of day it is. Our body systems are still going to be working. So there's a lot of factors that really go into weight gain or weight science. So one thing in terms of this myth is that it really kind of waters down um, all those other factors and weight science is complicated. It's not just calories in calories out. There is our socioeconomic status, our age, the stress that we might be having or living through, you know, how well or poor we might be sleeping, what medications we're taking, you know, what our microbiome, the gut bacteria living in our digestive tract are or aren't, you know, our dieting history, you know, lots and lots of factors that could keep going on. So, there are lots of reasons why potentially we might gain weight, but it's usually, it's definitely not due to the time of day that we're eating. Um, is it okay to eat, eat past 7 p.m.? I just want to say that absolutely, yes. If you are hungry, listen to that, to eat. Um, there might be many reasons why you're hungry past 7 p.m. You had a late workout. You had a really intense day. You used a lot of brain power. You... Maybe you were so busy, you didn't eat a ton during the working hours and now it's 7 p.m. and you have a chance to sit down and you're like, oh man, like I'm hungry because um, now I'm able to really listen to my body. So there are so many reasons that you need to eat. Um, so definitely don't feel like you have to fall into, okay, I can only eat before 7 p.m. If you are using food to soothe, because a lot of people in the evenings find that maybe they have that time to just sit on the couch, watch some Netflix, relax, and maybe they find that, okay, I'm, I'm reaching for a bag of chips, I'm reaching for X, Y, Z, whatever food it is, um, and maybe it's really as a coping tool. That is totally fine. Food is an excellent coping tool, but we just don't want it to be our only coping tool. Um, so thinking through, okay, what might be a better effective coping tool if I find that the evening times I am really using food as a way to soothe emotions. Um, we just don't want it to be our only way. So this is a faulty myth. You eating past 7 p.m. will not cause weight gain or store fat, you know, because of the timing, absolutely not. Let's move on to our next one here. Myth number two. So I have insert food can make you burn more calories and or fat. So this is based on the idea that there is a quick fix or that a certain one food or one ingredient can burn more calories or speeds up our metabolism. So this is really not true, I'm going to say. So we're going to kind of get into this a little bit because there's a few different ways to think about it. So first, the different types of foods that are commonly thought of with this are probably going to be like hot chili peppers, spicy foods, grapefruits are commonly touted as something that can burn more calories or, or burn fat, um, green tea, celery, garlic, um, chocolate. There are so many different foods that have been touted in this way. Um, largely, you might see these in like some big headlines in, you know, magazines and online and things like that. But it's really important to note that our metabolism is very much influenced by our genetics, as well as our body composition, which is also largely impacted by our genetics. So metabolism oftentimes is kind of at a set range of like how much we're going to be burning throughout the day. Um, and then our body composition, like if you have a higher muscle mass, muscle is really effective at utilizing energy, requires a lot of energy or calories to maintain itself. So metabolism really is not as easily shifted just by like specific one ingredient foods by any means. However, there is something called the thermic effect of food. This is a very normal physiological response to eating. So this is basically that when we eat foods, our body is using energy to break it down, digest it, absorb it, and take all those nutrients to different body organs. So there absolutely are calories and energy um, being utilized in normal digestion from consuming food. 
But if we look at the grand uh, or the bigger picture of metabolism, it's a very small amount. It's only 10 to 15% of our daily energy use goes to this thermogenesis or the thermic effect of food. So let's look at one specific food and see what the research has kind of shown. So we're going to look at capsaicin, which is a ingredient or a naturally incurring compound actually that's found in like spicy hot peppers or cayenne pepper. So we look here and you're going to see there's lots of different products. So this is just to really illustrate how diet culture really kind of um, picks up some of these pieces of nutrition science that are not totally true and really kind of like blows them up to be huge. And so we, as consumers, we look at this and we think, oh man, like this is going to help me. This is going to help me X, Y, Z. This is what I, I have been looking for. Again, it touts this ingredient, this capsaicin, these chili peppers as kind of a quick fix. And like, if I eat this, this is going to then happen. I might lose weight. I might X, Y, Z. So I just wanted to illustrate that with some of these images. But if we look at the studies, there have been some studies that have shown some effects on the thermogenesis of food and digestion using you know, these hot, spicy chili peppers. However, if we look at this one large meta-analysis critical review, what the researchers found is that there was some evidence showing capsaicin could support weight management. The big word there to keep in mind is could. However, the magnitude of these results was very, very, very small. So what they found is that there was a negative energy balance of 10 calories um, in an average weight, middle-aged man. And so what they found like through this theory and through their methods was that that would produce an average of 0.5 kilograms of weight loss over six and a half years. So that's a very, very small, very small amount of weight change. Um, but if we think through looking at these products here, like it kind of touts it as like, you take this and you're going to start, you know, seeing results. Um, but the science really doesn't show that. So I just want to really illustrate that headlines and sometimes nutrition science gets very overblown um, because the science is not, is not showing that by any means. Again, um, if we look at this huge um, meta-analysis and critical review, and they looked at a lot of different foods. I just picked out the capsaicin or the chili peppers. Um, but what they really are saying here is that energy balance is super complex. It has many factors involved and these types of myths or nutrition beliefs thrown out there and really perpetuated through diet culture are really minimizing the complexity of us as human beings and how our bodies work. Um, so definitely want you all to just keeping that in mind. There is a lot of future research needed because what they found in this massive review and critical analysis is that we don't have any research that shows long-term or really well-designed human studies and trials with any type of food. A lot of these things were done on mice. Again, we can't take mice studies and extrapolate those to human results. So there really are no conclusive results. There's not great evidence supporting these effects of any one specific food um, in relation to energy balance. All right, let's jump into number three. So myth number three is that a normal, and I have it in quotations for a reason, a normal or lower body mass index or BMI and a thin body size equals health or healthy. I just wanna let that sit for a second because this is something that our society has very deeply steeped as truth. We hold a lot of value with this. Um, the medical community as a whole very much perpetuates this. Um, there is a lot of science out there that also perpetuates this belief. But we're going to take a little deeper look at it. We're going to look a little bit um, at it from a different lens. So what I find is that this common nutrition belief is really based on a false idea that a smaller body size, a lower weight, or a lower BMI is health. And so we really kind of put this sort of body shape or size on a pedestal as something to attain, something to achieve, right? But there's a lot of problems with this way of thinking. The BMI in and of itself is a problematic um, 
method. It is something that I think the medical community, my profession as a whole, as a dietitian, uses very easily. Um, and it is not something that can, can or should be used to be a measure of someone's health. All it is, is a height to weight ratio. It doesn't tell us anything else. Um, it's really outdated. It was made over a hundred years ago for insurance companies by a mathematician who was a white male. It was made for typically white males, you know? And so now we are using this um, where there's a lot of limitations with the BMI. It does not account for our age, our sex, our gender, um, uh, different races as well. So if you go to the CDC website too, they even show some of these problems and limitations of the BMI on the, the CDC's website too. This again, this nutrition myth is, is perpetuating some weight bias and that thin ideal of, you know, being in this shape or size body is better than not being in that shape or size. Um, weight bias is something that people in larger bodies face throughout the medical community. Um, oftentimes, you know, BMI is used and I've seen this in practice too, you know, working with clients. Um, who live in larger bodies, who have experienced some of this, you know, stigma and bias um, from their doctors, from nurses, from people in their families. Um, and again, we cannot look at someone and assume their health status just by looking at a body size. So if you remember anything from this presentation, please remember that um, because weight, body size is not an indicator of health. So what, again, this does is this belief really discounts the complexities of health for all bodies and all people, because health is not just, you know, a number on the scale by any means that tells us nothing that just tells us what our mass weighs, right? That doesn't tell us or show us what we're doing every day, what behaviors we engage in, what our metabolic profiles look like in terms of lab works. So there are so many other things to factor into health um, and behaviors that people are engaging in, or maybe not engaging in. We cannot determine that or, you know, assume anything based off of weight, BMI, or body size. So one thing that I also like to call out is that there was a study by the University of California, and what the researchers did in this is that they looked over data from over 4,000, or sorry, 40 thousand participants using like the national health and national examination survey. And what they found was that nearly half of the people who are classified in the BMI scale as overweight um, and more than a quarter of those who were labeled as obese had perfectly healthy blood sugar and lipid or cholesterol markers. So that means they were cardiometabolically fine. They were healthy people. If you look deeper at, you know, their blood work. Um, meanwhile, 30% of those who fell into the normal weight category in the BMI scale actually had unhealthy levels of these biometric bio um, markers here. So they were not cardio metabolically healthy, but they were in a normal BMI. So many might assume, okay, you're, you're a thin size. You're within that normal BMI. You must be healthy. Not true. So again, we cannot assume anything by weight, by body size. Um, if we are wanting to really assess health or think through health, what I would encourage is really looking at what health promoting behaviors and other indicators can we, can we look at? Um, and again, with the tasty balance, what we do in our practice is, you know, we are, we're not using weight. By any means, we are focusing in on what can we do day to day in our lives through behaviors to support health. What are we not doing that we might be able to enhance in support of our health? So these are just eight ideas and some examples. So again, what I find for some people and in the medical medical community as a whole, some of these are not as rigid as weight is, right? Weight gives you a metric. The BMI scale gives you like a framework to just quickly just, you know, throw people into buckets, you know, good, bad needs work, blah, 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 whatever you, you know, medical community thinks the BMI shows. However, these behaviors listed here are a little bit more um, individualized. They're not these hard metrics of six, of success like weight um, usually is touted in diet culture and society. So first one here is body attunement. I find that people who are engaging in health promoting behaviors um, in a nourishing way 
really maybe have a little bit more attunement and understanding and self-awareness of their body, physical and emotional cues. Um, maybe it is enjoying um, movement, not using exercise as a punishment, but using exercise as a way to nourish oneself, regular and consistent and enjoying it. I think that's the key is enjoying movement, not feeling like we have to go on the treadmill. We have to run. We have to X, Y, Z, burn these calories, you know, things like that, but enjoyable, regular movement, um, effective coping skills to support our mental and emotional well-being. So, you know, thinking through, okay, do I have the strategies in place to handle life's stress? Um, and if I don't, um, do I know what I could do to support myself? Therapy highly recommend um, for everybody. Number four is some other health promoting behaviors, consistent intake of food with a variety of foods that are nutrient dense, but also being able to comfortably enjoy and, you know, eat without that guilt or shame, fun foods or foods that are not typically thought of as nutrient dense or healthier options. So I think that this is really key because I think oftentimes with nutrition specifically, we think we have to eat one way in order to be healthy and we need to cut out all these foods. We have to cut out all these things that are quote unquote bad. We have to only eat these things and that's how we can achieve health. Not true. Um, health is really multifactorial. It's not just, you know, one area. It really has to kind of be this holistic approach to health. Um, hydration, you know, are we also being mindful with our alcohol and caffeine intake? Are we drinking enough fluids overall? What about our weight? I think weight, um, while our practice does not use it as an indicator of health, one thing that it can tell us, especially if we have these constant changes over time of weight loss, weight regain, weight loss, weight regain, research has shown that that can actually be more um, problematic for our health than a stable weight. So, you know, is our weight stable or is it kind of constantly fluctuating in, in you know, bigger ways? Um, safe sex practices. This is a health promoting behavior, you know, um, and an indicator of health, um, as well as, you know, what do our, those biomarkers, those lab metrics show? And I just listed a few of them there. There's many more. So our cholesterol, our blood sugars, our hemoglobin A1, A1C, different types of markers of inflammation. Um, these are all ways that we can better assess health versus using weight solely or that BMI scale as an indicator of health. I'm gonna pause here, let you guys digest a little bit of what I've said. Um, let me check, I'm gonna to try to check here. Jenny, maybe you can unmute yourself and tell me if we have any questions here. Oh wait, we do have a chat. Okay, I'm trying to figure it out. Well, I, I just, I, that chat okay. is for me because I was just reacting oh, okay. to the, um, <laughs> the pepper information Oh yeah, and the actual science and just how, you know, people want to make money, right? And so they can latch yeah. onto that small piece of science and then use it to profit. Um, totally, totally, exactly. Um, we'll, we'll just keep going right through then with myth number four. This one I think is really big too, especially in you know the current um, century we're living in. Organic foods are better for your health. I will be 100% honest. I have subscribed to this at some points in my career and in my life. Absolutely. People in my family very much hold on to this belief. Um, there's nothing wrong with that by any means. And if this is your preference, there is nothing wrong with that either. But also thinking through where does my belief or this preference stem from? So let's take a look at what the science shows. Um, this again, this myth or this belief is based on the false idea that our conventionally grown foods are inferior, that they are not as good. And I think what this also does is it perpetuates what is called the health halo effect. This is where we kind of tout certain foods. We put them on a pedestal, right? We very much, you know, make them seem like they are superior to others. Um, there are lots of foods like gluten-free foods, organic foods, you know, lots of things that we can name that have this health halo effect, but maybe aren't really as nutritionally superior or as quote unquote healthy as we may, you know, think, or as the media and culture puts out. So one thing to keep in mind here is that organic food marketing can sometimes be misleading. Organic only really refers to the agricultural practices of how a food was produced. It has nothing, it says nothing about the nutritional quality 
of a food. So that's where organic food marketing can be super misleading because A, organic foods are grown with organic approved pesticides and herbicides. They are not totally free from these. They're just different types of pesticides and herbicides. Um, and also organic labels on foods and food packages have different degrees of organic. So there are products that have 100% organic ingredients. Some of them are, you know, 75% or less. Some of them only have one or two ingredients. So not everything that's labeled as organic is necessarily created equal. Um, and again, organic is referring to the agricultural practices, not the health benefits or nutritional quality of the product. So that can get, oftentimes be really misconstrued um, with marketing. There is no evidence to date that shows organic food are nutritionally superior to conventionally grown. There have been some studies that have shown very negligible differences in conventional versus organically grown produce, but negligible, very small differences. Um, one thing that I think can be really helpful to also take a look at is, you know, some people really like to rely on organic foods because of the potential for pesticide residues. Um, so this is really key to keep in mind is that pesticide residue is something that can impact our health and it's really dose dependent. So that dose dependency thing is key. So for example, um, based off this link here, this is a really great place to go for some non-biased um, information regarding pesticide residues on food. Um, it is an association of, I believe, organic farmers and another farming alliance um, that highlight this. So basically, if you were to think through, let's say kale, we, we tout that as a very superior food. If you were to eat 18,615 servings of kale in a day, which A, no one would do because that's insane. Um, I don't want to chew that much kale. Um, as an adult or as a child, over 7,700 servings of kale in a day, we would still not have any health effects from the residues, from the pesticide residues. And that is according to an analysis from toxicologists that are at the University of California in their personal chemical exposure program. So should you choose organic? I think absolutely, if it fits your budget, if it lets you cook and eat how you like and how you prefer to eat, and if it can be easily you know, found most of the time, then I think absolutely organic foods can be a very sustainable choice for you and your health. Um, but it is not necessarily something that is going to drastically change your health. It is not something that is necessarily needed and organic foods are really not nutritionally superior um, by any means. So I find that when I, you know, was able to really recognize this and, and read the research, like for me, it was like, okay, I can certainly like change how I'm buying food because there is a point in my life. I worked for a large grocery company who very much touted organic foods as the way to be and the only way to eat in order to be healthy. And I subscribed to that because I was bombarded with that information all day long. I had to promote that information because of my job, which really isn't very ethical. Um, and so I kind of like, you know, drank the Kool-Aid. I, I really was... Um, believing that um, kind of false truth there. And when I finally was able to take a step back and look at the research and see what it was all sharing and showing, you know, it, it was a little bit of a relief, like, okay, it is, it is okay to not eat organic, you know, um, if I want to, and I like to, absolutely, if, if it's my preference, but health wise, nutrition wise, um, there is no um, significant changes or differences there. Um, one thing I will say, if you are concerned about how your food is grown and that is important to you for sustainability and other practices, go to, if you have the access to go to farmer's markets, talk to your local farmers and see what they do out in their fields. I mean, we're here in the Midwest. We have lots of access to farmers all around the city and the suburbs. So absolutely. As we're going into the growing season, you know, getting to know some farmers, visiting some farms, if you're able to talking, um, that's a great way to learn about how food is produced as well. So my nose is running um, from seasonal allergies and I don't have a tissue, so that's great. <laughs> Excuse me as I keep sniffling over here. Um, I wanted to just do a quick little critical thinking activity here. So you don't have to unmute yourselves, just thinking in your heads, 
what choices do we typically think are healthy? You know, so we have two options. We have a organic brownie and then we have a regular brownie. We have some organic broccoli and we have some regular conventionally grown broccoli. Um, the answer here, kind of a trick question I'd say, is that not necessarily any, right? So like the organic versus conventional broccoli, they're both awesome choices. They both give you tons of vitamins, minerals, fiber. Um, they are great choices no matter what you, you pick. The brownies are both brownies. An organic brownie does not make it healthier. It still has, you know, sugar and it still has, you know, lots of stuff in there. It's a fun food. It's something that we should enjoy and have, but it's not going to give us nutritional benefit just because it's organic. It's still a brownie. It's still, uh, you know, kind of that, that fun food. So let your food choices be guided by your budget, by your personal preferences. Um, and don't necessarily believe that organic is superior to not. Okay. All right. Excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, those, those April allergies are coming on strong here. Um, okay. And this is my last myth. So this one is a big one. This one is a big one. I hear this all the time. Um, sugar is addictive. Okay. Think about that. Think if you have thought this, or if you've heard people say this, or if you have read this in any headlines or anywhere. So what this belief, what this nutrition kind of myth really does is it, again, it creates fear of food and it grossly generalizes science. Um, what, you know, unfortunately, this is an idea that has really been touted for a very long time. You know, that sugar has the same toxic effects on the brain and the body as someone or as, you know, really illegal street drugs do. That's that in and of itself, that idea, you know, thinking about it kind of non-biasedly is fairly a very big claim, right? A very large claim to be saying. And again, that diet culture way of thinking that diet culture, you know, societal norms, they make us think that because sugar is so harmful in this way that it has to be tightly controlled. We have to highly regulate how much we eat and when we eat it. Um, and really, you know, the research has been highly misinterpreted and packaged in a way that really confuses us. Like it, it is really difficult to navigate through this, you know, because we see this pushed everywhere in mainstream media. And so again, this is uh, something that is overly generalized. What I want to illustrate here is that pleasure does not equal addiction. So sugar and sweet foods and cakes and cookies and things that have sugar in them are generally foods we love because they taste good. Maybe they elicit some memories of our childhood of you know grandma's cake or pies at Thanksgiving or whatever it is, ice cream for me, I love ice cream. Um, but pleasure does not equate to addiction. Um, certainly when you eat or engage in pleasurable things, dopamine is gonna be increased. But same, you know, you might get dopamine from, you know, hugging a family member, from petting puppies, you know, and of course food might as well provide some dopamine too. But just because we get a little bit of dopamine does not mean that it is an addiction or the same as, you know, street drugs. So absolutely not. Eating something that you enjoy is going to increase your dopamine in the same way all pleasurable things might. Um, but addiction and pleasure are not the same thing. Something to keep in mind with this nutrition belief, however, is that what this again leads to is thinking that we have to deprive ourselves. We cannot, you know, if sugar is addictive, I have to really watch what I eat. I, I can't eat it. Um, and so one thing to keep in mind is that any sort of deprivation um, centering around food generally results in like a food scarcity mindset. So when we think through, oh, I can't have that, right? Oftentimes what results is we start overthinking about it. You know, if I am cutting out sugar, I can't have it. I can no longer have it in my coffee. I can't have a treat in the evening. I can't go out to, you know, for ice cream with my friends or X, Y, Z, whatever it is, right? We start to kind of maybe think about that food more. We start to really like miss it. Um, we might find that it's really difficult to concentrate or focus on things that we usually enjoy because it's like, we're going out to eat and now we're like, oh, I can't have dessert or I can't order this, you know, drink or I can't do this. And so we're like kind of holding it in or thinking about it. And we're almost a little bit obsessing over what we can't have. We're really preoccupied with that. So 
I also find that this is common too, like in parents, depending on where you are in phase of life, if you are a caregiver or you have small children in your life, this is something that too, parents tend to maybe deprive or restrict for kids. Um, and some of these kind of symptoms of deprivation, that preoccupation, that constantly thinking about in kids, it might lead to maybe sneaking these food items because you know they now think I'm bad if I'm eating them. So I'm going to sneak them by myself. So mom and dad or caregiver don't know. No. So these kind of deprivation signs and symptoms actually can get misconstrued as addictive behaviors, but they're not. They're absolutely not. Um, it is, you know, and I'll show you on the next slide kind of why. Um, and again, my last thing here is that this nutrition myth and belief around sugar that it's addictive is really taking science from rats and generalizing it to humans. So a lot of this myth here is based off of rat studies where what they did was they actually um, deprived them of food and then they gave them, you know, uh, liquid um, sucrose or, you know, kind of table sugar um, and the rats went crazy. <laughs> and so that is where, you know, now we take that study and it gets blown up in the headlines that, that sugar is addictive. Well, if you look at like how those rats were, like they ate very little during the day, they were fasted state, and then that was all they had offered to them and they were starving. So of course they were going to go crazy because they were starving. Um, so we cannot take that rat research and generalize this to humans. And also that design of the study was very faulty. Um, so what this sort of myth or belief around sugar that it's addictive can do, right? It perpetuates the deprivation or that severe restriction. And this image here is a, um, just a vision of the cycle. So when we restrict ourselves from eating a food, I'm going to start here. Can you guys see my mouse? I think so. Where it says restriction on the top left. It says restriction. I have to control my body by restricting a certain food type or dieting behavior, right? So I have to stop eating sugar. Then what happens is we start obsessing over it. We sort of feel out of control when it's in the house. We feel like we can't stop thinking about it when we're out at someone's house. We find that it's something that we're always thinking about. We're missing X, Y, Z. Then what happens is eventually deprivation can't last forever. We eat that food. But then it's like, I can't just have that slice or that, that scoop of ice cream. I haven't had it in a month. I need all that I can get because I have missed it so much. Right. So then we start to feel out of control around sugar. Um, and maybe we tend to binge or overeat on it because we have restricted it and deprived it from ourselves or touted it as a bad thing. And then after we eat it, or maybe we kind of eat a larger portion of it, we feel shame. We feel intense guilt and regret. And man, I am bad for eating that sugar, or I am addicted to sugar because I can't stop myself. But really it's more so the behaviors of deprivation and restriction that create and perpetuate this cycle. Um, so that is just kind of the example there to keep in mind. So um, those are all the myths that I've kind of went through. So I am Going to let that sink in because I know that that was a lot of different myths in a short amount of time. Um, we're going to quickly go into the last section of this presentation, which is really to aid you in being able to find credible nutrition information and sources because the internet is a scary place sometimes. And I want you to feel empowered and confident looking up nutrition information because we all do that. You know, we don't always need to go to a dietitian or our doctor. Sometimes you might want to look something up on the internet, but we want to make sure that we know where we can get our information from um, in a way that is going to be promoting sound nutrition science and is not going to be, you know, really continuing to perpetuate these diet culture beliefs and myths around nutrition and food. So let's jump in here to this quick guide for that. So a couple things to keep in mind is number one, consider the source. Is the source a personal website for someone's business? Is it a personal Instagram page for someone? You know, what is the type of source that you're going to? Is it an institution like a university or an extension program? Is it a healthcare system? Is it a government website? Those are likely more credible sources because they are providing more unbiased, you know, they, their purpose is to educate um, in an unbiased way and really share, you know, and guide people um, with, with sound nutrition science or health science. 
And number two, know the purpose and credentials. So if you find that you go to a website, it's someone's personal business, look also at like, what's their purpose? Are they trying to sell me a supplement or sell me their theory of nutrition? Um, do they have credentials? And, and I want to be clear that sometimes you can go to a place that's like maybe a doctor or even a dietitian's website um, and they want to help people, right? That's why they're in the profession. Um, but maybe they're also trying to sell me a book. Um, I think that you kind of have to look at a few different angles. You know, we want to look at all these different items to really assess um, if this is a credible source. So just because someone is a doctor or a dietitian or XYZ does not mean that they're credible, credible on their own. Um, you want to make sure that they are using evidence and ideally peer-reviewed research that they're linking to studies and research that has been done to back up their, you know, what they're sharing with you as, as advice. Check the date. This is really key because you could go to a lot of places and read some blog posts that were, you know, back in 2012. Um, nutrition science, especially just health science in general, is constantly changing. There's new research all the time. And so things are always updated and changing. And so if something is really outdated or not medically reviewed recently in the past couple of years, likely it's possibly a little out to date and that information may not be um, credible anymore. You can always double check and ask a qualified healthcare provider like your doctor or someone you might be working with um, before following advice that maybe you found on the internet. That's always a great idea in general, just to kind of say, hey, I heard this. What are your thoughts on this? You know, to your doctor or XYZ. Um, understand the research, or I'm sorry, again, understand that research can and should change. We kind of touched on this with number four already. Um, number seven. Be cautious if a website or a social media influencer is using some pretty big claims, like maybe they're using any of those myths, you know, sugar is addictive, and then they're trying to sell you something at the same time. Likely, you know, they're kind of spewing those false beliefs in support of making a profit. That is not credible. That's really not great. Um, and then number eight, I clearly made a mistake here. I wrote, be cautious of, and I didn't finish it. And I don't really know what <laughs> my creative thought was there. Um, so we'll skip to the next slide. Um, this one here, again, is just illustrating the same things we just touched on. So this, you know, let's take two different potential sources. One might be credible. The other one might kind of give you some red flags. So those red flags might be that it hasn't been updated recently. It's a personal website and a, or a personal business. And it's really kind of cherry picking the research to support its product or its claims. So maybe the website, there's no qualifications. It's not an institution um, website. Um, it's a personal website as well. So a credible source might likely have probably many things off of that list we just looked at. So it's updated or reviewed recently. It links to peer reviewed research and lots, you know, good amount of it. Um, it, you know, has qualifications listed of the writer or the authors. Um, it's a public institution, like a healthcare system and, you know, an education organization, the government website, things like that. So hopefully that helps you kind of weed through because there is so much out there that it can be really difficult to decipher what is factual and what maybe is just kind of nutrition science inflated for, you know, supporting some of these more faulty claims or diet culture myths and beliefs. So now we can kind of open it up and take a look at, um, or just open it up to a question and answer. So I do have my email address here if you ever wanted to email. I will say that I do not provide nutrition advice over email. That is certainly something that if you're interested, scheduling time together to meet one-on-one -on -one is excellent. Um, but certainly little questions that you might have, if they're appropriate, I'm happy to, to address over email. And that is our practice website, thetastybalance.com. I'm also on social media. It's really more of my personal thing, but sometimes I'll share like some good recipes and things like that um, on there as well. You might see my kids going crazy outside in the garden as well. But <laughs> um, so that is a little bit about how to get in touch. So I'll leave it open if there's any questions. We have about nine minutes. If anyone has anything, feel free to chat it or um, unmute yourself. Yeah, feel free to ask questions. I, I'm, I'm kind of curious with our audience, if anything you learned today was surprising to you or something new.
Claire, did you unmute yourself? I did. Sorry. Okay. Here I was. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to turn my camera off because I can't see. No worries. <laughs> Probably. Anyway, um, I was going to say something, and then when you asked about um, if there was something we learned, and then the, my brain just kind of froze, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> fine. You're fine. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What did I learn? I was fascinated. <laughs> like, I think I knew about organic, um, but I do always feel guilty. Like, I pass in the produce department now at my price chopper they now have a special place for the organic vegetables and the price on them is just like unbelievable and I always yeah. feel like ah, I should be paying more but it so that was nice I can walk by it and keep walking and not feel guilty yeah absolutely and I think that's you know again that personal preference or what fits into your budget I would never want someone to feel like I okay I have to eat organic so I'm gonna blow you know my family's budget and buying organic produce and then we can't you know afford things in other areas of our life that we need like that's not a good or probably really a healthy choice you know in many different areas of life um so again yeah but hopefully feeling confident in the grocery store that like it's okay if I don't buy organic I'm still providing myself with like nutrient dense options even if they're conventionally grown mm -hmm. Um, I was curious and like with all the people that work at the library, you know, we have this, I know it's not unique to Humana, but um, our healthcare provider has this whole, I call it gamification of health care, right? Like we have these challenges, I get on every day, see how many points I earned yesterday, how many am I going to, and it's really made a difference for me. And I'm like, am I being brainwashed? Am I, you know what I mean? It's, um, but I'm into it and it really does help even, um, you know, just challenging myself. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of times like employee wellness programs and, and insurance type of like incentive campaigns and things like there's, there's a lot of great stuff in those, you know, to really support and engage in health supportive behaviors. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And speaking of you get 35 points today for attending this <laughs> presentation. <laughs> That's a good amount of points. I don't know how much you get, but that's that's good. Yeah, it is, <laughs> it is pretty cool. good, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think for me, like I think it's just personal, you know, how obsessed you get with it. <laughs> if it's like yeah. if it's interrupting other things and you're really not enjoying your life because you're worried about your points, then you need to think about it, maybe. Um yeah. Yeah. You know, but it can be a really helpful way to kind of motivate you as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? I have a question, Diana, not to put you yeah. on the spot. Um, <laughs> but, you know, a lot of times I think there's confusion with research about correlation and causation. Um, so, you know, there is a lot of correlation between, for example, a higher BMI and lower health outcomes, poor health outcomes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so could you just, just explore that a little? Well, yes. So, I mean, correlation is basically like a statistical indicator of the relationship between variables, right? But a causation is showing that one variable is directly impacted or changed by the other. And so a lot of times, yes, there is correlations shown in nutrition science or health science, but the causation is not something that the evidence is showing yet. So it, I think those two words in and of itself, like can be really confusing. And sometimes we use like really interchangeably, but causation is where we could then show, like, say for instance, in that sugar is addictive, right? Like that claim right there is really much showing like, okay, sugar causes addiction, right? That's kind of what that claim really is, is trying to say, but it, that's not what the research shows by any means. There is no causation shown. Um, there's a correlation between, you know, maybe sugar impacting the same centers of the brain as, you know, drugs might, but that does not mean a causation. Does that kind of make sense? <laughs> I don't know if I said yeah. that correctly. Well, it okay. does. And I think mm -hmm. it like, it takes away, like correlation mm -hmm. doesn't take into account other factors that yeah. might contribute to an outcome. Exactly. So. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the thing I think with science is that like, 
There are so many factors, you know, and even if a research study maybe did show a causation, you have to see, okay, well, what, like what kind of environment or what methods did they use in that study? Like, was it only on five people versus 50,000 people, right? Like there's a lot of different stuff there. Um, you know, in my family, I have family members who really subscribe to like the Berkeley wellness letter and, and stuff like that, which has some really great and valuable information in it. But there are headlines in that wellness letter that make it sound like this study really highlights a ton of causation for health or nutrition science. And when you look deeper at the research, it's like, well, that was a seven person study. And you know, it doesn't also account for what else they might've been doing in their life to impact X, Y, Z or what they weren't doing, you know? So nutrition science and just like science in general can be really tricky. And certainly animal studies, you know, we cannot take as fact for humans, like, and, and let's be real. There's a lot of nutrition science that is lacking because of funding. Um, you know, so there's a lot of stuff that we need to study, but there's not the funding for, um, and that gets into a whole nother. Yeah. That's a really talk. good topic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions before we wrap up for today? I have one real quick. I was curious about um, these online or these apps like Noom. Oh uh, yeah. What do, what do you think about Noom? Okay. So there's a lot of thoughts and I will try to keep them simplified. So I think that there, it depends on the reason why. So I find that like people go to Noom or Weight Watchers, right? Because they probably are wanting to lose weight. That's why they, you know, that's what those apps are touted for. Um, I think that there can be benefits in terms of maybe engaging in some health supportive behaviors that the app promotes. But I also find that some of those sort of like tracking apps where they use like a stoplight system for foods um, and, and give you like a calorie range, it, it really degrades your body's like ability to rely on itself, you know, and then you start to second guess yourself and you start to be, you know, maybe feel like I, I can't eat outside of this limitation or I can't eat these foods because they're red. And then it really just like everything gets hard and we stop, you know, really paying attention to like what we like, what makes us feel nourished and well, and we're focusing in on what something external is telling us to eat. Um, and maybe weight loss is not the, the route to health. Maybe it's all those other behaviors that we looked at. Um, so I think that it's a tricky thing for me to answer. I will say I am not necessarily, um, I would, I, I don't promote them. Um, but if people come and they want to work with a dietitian in conjunction with working with those, we might explore like, okay, why are you using this? And what is helping you? What is not helping you? What is confusing you? And like, how can we take a look at your value systems and your nutrition beliefs and maybe break down kind of what, what is best to focus in on for you and your health and your goals? So I don't necessarily think, you know, it's a bad thing to use them, but I think they can be really um, damaging at times and really difficult to navigate. Um, mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions in our last moment together? <laughs> well, thank you all for your time today. I appreciate you all being here and allowing me to share some information with you. <laughs> well, thank you, Diana, for lending your expertise to us today. I was really excited to talk with you before this presentation and, and that you were able to do this for us today. Yeah. Um, and we appreciate those of who were able to attend. Um, if you're an employee of the library, just a reminder, if you would like Go365 points for today, mm -hmm. speaking of those points, uh, please send me an email or you can direct message me in the chat and I'll just hang out here for a minute um, and I'll make sure to get this over to um, HR. And with that, I wish you a wonderful afternoon. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.